Okay, everyone, how you doing? Thanks to, uh, for attending our, this last session. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, attestations and how we're using them at Autodesk to help secure our software supply chain. Um, my name is Jesse Sanford. I'm a software architect at Autodesk, and I work on our internal developer platform and uh, how we apply software supply chain security um, through our internal developer platform to our product uh, and um, the software that we produce. When I'm not in front of a computer, I, uh, I'm a backpacker and a sailor, and I have two, so two young daughters. Hey all, uh, my name is Jaydish. I work as an application security engineer at Autodesk. My primary focus being around supply chain security and uh, software composition analysis. All right, so quick agenda. Uh, first, let's level set on the state of software supply chain security in the industry and it, how it is actually practically applied right now. Um, and next, we'll consider some challenges that companies like Autodesk are facing when uh, applying those software supply chain security practices. And after that, we'll do some storytelling, which should be fun. And then we'll briefly talk about how attestations help tell the story of our SDLC. Um, and I'll pass the baton to Jagadesh to actually do a demo uh, of the production of attestations and how we verify them. And finally, we'll give some pragmatic tips on how you can get started and where you can go. So let's get real <laughs> about software supply chain security and where it's at right now. Um, can I see a quick show of hands uh, for those of you who believe that you have a robust software supply chain security practice inside your organization? Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 that's not unexpected, right? Um, anyone sells to level three comprehensively in their organization? Level four? Very good, all right, we got a couple. Um, but again, you know, it, it is the case that uh, while the open source community has progressed, um, inside of organizations, inside their walls, it's, it's somewhat piecemeal still, right? We have things like uh, standards and public good infrastructure out there. Major SDM providers are now doing things like providing salsa provenance. Um, and we have you know, projects like Kubernetes and even you now the NPM uh, repository offering salsa provenance at scale. Uh, I think there was like 5,000 plus packages that were quoted in the keynote yesterday. Um, and that's great. Uh, but you know, behind the walls, right, um, you know, we all kind of like know that there's some dirty laundry there. And uh, I believe that's because uh, getting large organizations, especially enterprises, to change the way that they build their software is tough. It's difficult to, to turn a ship, right, um, at, that, at that size. And so um, things like you know, technology inertia and brownfield uh, applications um, and variant, varying compliance standards, uh, those can be real impediments at scale. And our Autodesk, we are no different, right? We have our own technology inertia. Um, as an example, you might have seen, I did an, a talk at uh, the OSS Summit in Vancouver in 2023 about adapting uh, artifact signing with six-door tooling for our classic Jenkins CI uh, uh, processes. And um, you know, we also have a, a continuous stream of acquisitions that, that are always coming in year over year, and they bring their own diversity. And so we need something that can wrap all of that diversity, something that is adaptable, something that can encompass the SDLC from, from soup to nuts. So let's talk about that SDLC. Here's an example of the life of a software artifact at Autodesk. Um, and it's not un unlike probably many SDLC uh, uh, pipelines that you've seen, right? Um, and notice the, the path it takes from, from ideation to consumption or runtime. And how can we describe that path that a particular build takes in a, in a trustful way? And as I mentioned in, in the beginning there, I am the father of two young girls, and as most parents, I read a lot of stories. Lots, lots of stories, hundreds of them, uh, if not thousands in the past decade. And in thinking about the path that a build takes, it reminded me of a story, right? A story of a journey of a particular piece of software through its development life cycle. So what does that story look like? Well, to start with, each build can have its own book, right? 
And then we can have each phase in the build, like CI and CD, be another chapter in that book. And for each step in the phase, like a build step, we can have another page. And on those pages, we will have statements about those steps. And those statements are made up of, of what we expect from those steps, right? Um, and ultimately, these are just signals that we can use to judge if a particular build is good or trustful. And if we think about the story of an SDLC process in an arc, we can see how those signals can now be combined into those pages, and those pages can become the chapters in our book. And just like reading a book, we can stop the story if we don't like it. And on that, when my oldest daughter was quite a bit younger, we attempted to read The Lord of the Rings, probably at age six. And um, it was a little too early. It was dark and kind of scary for her, a little too serious. So we put it down for a couple of years. And then later when she was older and more mature, she was much more interested in it. And she made me read it to her twice. And that, that's okay. Sometimes we need to mature a bit, right? Sometimes we need to have a little bit more understanding about what's going on before we move forward through these stories. And like books, we can also skim them, right? We don't need every step, just enough to tell a trustful story. Start with the signals that actually help it become trusted faster, and then if you're interested, you can embellish. So back to our SDLC story. We can only tell the expected journey of our builds. What we don't know or what we don't expect, we don't want to rely upon. So we instrument these places uh, that we expect to build trust on. And, and then, you know, uh, you know, through the different parts of that process, we produce these signals that then allow us to know if a particular build is trustful. And these signals are what we're calling our trust telemetry. And at scale across all builds in the SDLC, for a particular piece of software over time, the signals of uh, this telemetry of trustworthiness helps us uh, build the trustworthiness in the build, right? And, and uh, with this trust telemetry, we can start to judge builds against our expectations. And those expectations we can, be, we can produce as policies. And so for, for the, you know, we can use these policies at each phase or even each step um, to figure out if we want to proceed or abort. Uh, because this tele telemetry is now indicating whether or not things are looking trustworthy. And we can decide based on the risk profile of where that build is going to go or to be deployed, whether or not we want to gate with policy or not. Maybe we just want to have a manual review if something starts to look sideways. And why not create policies uh, with trust telemetry, right? Like, this concept is not new. You know, I, we use it in our daily lives already. I, I have a smartwatch. How many of you have a smartwatch? Does anyone use it to unlock their computer, right? So this trust telemetry helps us you know, provide these signals of trust and we can decide whether or not our expectations are being met. They're just a, a snapshot of that trustfulness of our SDLC. Each signal is a statement right, of an expected process that we instrument for visibility. Just like a, a court where a witness gives testimony under oath, our statements are now sworn to or attested to by our, our instrumented steps in our SDLC. And individually, they may only give little bits of trust. But in aggregate, they build up to something much bigger than the sum of their parts. They provide this context you know, that can be cryptographically verified, and that's very powerful. They bring the, the picture into focus, which allows us to make smarter, more informed policy decisions. And, and by standardizing on a metadata format for these statements about our SDLC, right, we can start to bridge this broad diversity of all of this tooling. You can think about how many static analysis tools that a company like Autodesk uses to build all of that software. Uh, all of these tools have their own proprietary metadata and APIs, and they store that data in their own backends or databases. How can we make policies that bridge all of those things, right? How can we future-proof those policies so that when we decide to change out one tool for another, we don't have to go and rewrite the way that all those policies are implemented? Um, you know, and, and you know, the attestations, they, they have these types, right? They, they, the semantics. They're well understood and, and kind of negotiated ahead of time. Um, and those semantics, uh, uh, the, with, the, with those semantics, those tools, if the tool can map to those semantics, you can have this kind of abstraction on top of it that's tool agnostic. 
So when we start to think about how these attestations can help span all of these security tools and how they can abstract that metadata that they produce, we get into this realm of where these attestations themselves actually become this kind of API or framework for helping aggregate the value of all those tools, right? Um, it's very similar to other tools that aggregate you know, underlying functionality and mask implementation details like you can think of like Terraform, for instance, right? Or, or the Kubernetes operator framework and, and how it can mask the, you know, the, the, the reconcilers behind it. And there's this KubeCon EU talk from 2023 that Aditya Sirish and Cole Kennedy did um, that talks about you know, uh, attestations becoming the API of DevSecOps. And there's some links in the slides here. I, I highly recommend it. So what is an attestation, right? At their simplest, they are expected claims about a process. And they are time-stamped, and hopefully persistent and immutable. And they're also cryptographically verifiable. Some common examples are in the Intoto attestation format, uh, and, and like a lesser, less familiar SCITT statements uh, uh, from this IETF framework. And here's, a, here's kind of like a view of the composition of attestations, and this is taken directly from the Intoto docs. Um, notice the attestations are, are usually linked to an artifact or subject, and by linking them this way, you can kind of aggregate them together, um, and, and if you invert that link, you can kind of query and return everything for a particular artifact. And, and here's kind of like the Intoto attestation spec in detail. We have this predicate which defines the action taken, and we have a statement which binds that action to the subject, and then we have this envelope which wraps the whole thing and provides that, those cryptographic guarantees. So predicates, they're like the, 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 these types of actions. And to me, they're the most interesting part of the attestation payload. And that's where the semantics about what's inside the attestation come into play, and it tells you like what happened to a particular subject. For instance, you can say that you know, a particular artifact was scanned, or that the pizza smelled delicious, smelled delicious, or that Jesse is wearing his, his Apple Watch, right? That, that, that wearing the smartwatch is, is the predicate there. Um, and there are many common in total attestation predicate types. And, and you can customize them. You can create your own, right? You can create one that suits your needs. But the important part is the semantics there. So it's like, you know, if you have a very specific uh, 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 use case, if, if the semantics don't really wrap more than just that particular use case, it's not really as useful, right? It doesn't give you that abstraction. But it certainly can be helpful in verifying things. So here's one of the most common that many of you probably have seen, certainly if you're, if you're you know, uh, already implementing Celsa level three, um, you, know, you have this uh, 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 concept of provenance uh, with Celsa. And so this, this uh, attestation helps you understand like, what happened to, uh, to produce a build over time, right? You can, you can collect all of the data necessary to understand um, you know, how a build came to be. And there's some other interesting ones, SBOMs and Vuln scans. You can probably imagine what, what's in those, right? Um, and you know, we, there's, there's, there's many different types, but uh, uh, and you know, the, the important part is uh, you know, how we actually generate those. How can we generate those in a trusted way? And there's many tools to help deal with that, right? And so now I'm gonna hand it over to Jagadesh, who's gonna take you through some examples and a demo. Hey, I'll uh, to generate attestations, we have a few choices at this point, and many of those are uh, open source tools. Uh, each of these have their own uh, benefits and drawbacks. Here, uh, we mentioned some examples over here. Some missed ones are like, uh, we have something like chain loop, which can be used to generate these as well. Uh, but we wanted to balance the benefits, drawbacks, and reduce the developer frictions, uh, friction on the process as well. So. The main reason is enhancing legacy pipelines is a costly process, uh, needing a lot of engineering effort. Like for example, we have roughly five to six lakh builds running in a week. So how can we seamlessly introduce or encapsulate this process into those pipelines or how we can reduce the developer effort to get this introduced or how we can automate the data collection without any interaction itself as much as possible. So uh, this is where uh, platforming the build pipelines comes into the picture, and uh, Autodesk has been making lots of stride in this area since past few years. Uh, and for us, right, uh, Witness makes a perfect use case uh, here. Uh, Witness can actually generate multiple statements in a single execution, collecting whatever data it can uh, during the build pipeline. And uh, the execution is pretty much straightforward, and. Uh, with minimal learning curve. Also, uh, we have a great contact with the maintainers uh, who, who share a uh, common vision with us over there. So 
Witness is basically an open source tool uh, developed by TestifySec and uh, donated to Intuito. Uh, Witness has a unique approach in the way it generates, stores, and verifies the attestation for an artifact. Uh, its ability to have the centralized uh, policies, uh, which decouples the SDLC and uh, security or compliance workflow, uh, which, uh, which helped us to take a decision to move towards it. Um, this basically helps the security and compliance folks to review, update uh, these policies from time to time while reducing the need to update the build pipelines. So now, an artifact, right? Uh, it can be a Docker image or a DLL or whatever it can be. It, it goes through multiple phases uh, before it's ready for distribution or deployment. Uh, all these phases can generate an attestation of its own, and it's nearly impossible to store all these into a single collection. Now, what happens is that we end up with multiple pages of these stages, and uh, it it's really becomes a nightmare to manage all of this. In case of a single build pipeline, we end up with a bundle of pages instead of a book in terms of multiple build pipelines, we get a lot more. And storing and retrieving these comprehensively or in a sensible way is going to be a nightmare. So uh, to solve this, we use Archivista, which is also a part of uh, Intoto Suit. Uh, it's, it, it, it is basically a GraphQL uh, and storage service provider. Uh, it, it basically uh, takes the uh, Intoto attestation, scrapes the data for a bit, and uh, provides us a, a way to query this. Uh, coming to the next slide, like so, generating the attestations and storing them is a step of that. But what is the use of it, right? With a, like without a specific use case or a way to verify these, these are just a noise or other document which we just store. So, uh, witness also helps us uh, to basically verify each step of the uh, build process by having a centralized policies for it. And each step or each attestation can have independent policies. And uh, basically, uh, this can be updated on the fly and uh, applied instantaneously. With these attestations, we should be able to verify ideation to creation of an artifact, uh, which was like basically to say that it was done by a trusted source. So here's a mini demo of how an attestation is generated. Uh, looks like I'm not able to fast forward it, but yeah. So yeah, here I have a simple Jenkins pipeline where I'm cloning a repository, configuring a witness, uh, running a simple pip build, uh, pip install, uh, uh, running a scan using snake uh, to generate an SBOM, uh, and I'm verifying the compliance of it. Then I'm modifying the artifact which was generated over here and uh, modifying it and verifying it to be frank. Let me scrape a bit. So this is Jenkins pipeline I have been running locally. So here you can see each step of the build pipeline. Uh, like I clone the repository, I configure the witness, and I have running I have been running the pip install command with witness over here. Uh, running the sneak command to generate an SBOM on the requirements file. Uh, here I'm checking the policies of it, so I'll, I'll get back to the policies which were applied over here shortly. So this is a sample attestation which was generated from the build. So this is how it looks like. You So you basically have a payload, its structure, and uh, the signature of the file to verify like the file was not modified in the first place. So here are a couple of sample uh, policies I have applied. Uh, so it can be as simple as the exit code of the command being executed, whether it's successful or not, or it can be uh, you can verify the signature, PGP signature of the committer to make sure that's a trusted developer, or other than that, you can verify that the file which was generated or which was cloned from Git was modified during the build process. So 
so git tracks the status of the file right like when it's cloned like whether the file was modified post clone so we would be able to verify like what files were as it is when it was cloned from or it was it modified during the build process so these policies are integrated into a json file in, uh, and uh, the json is encrypted and uh, it's stored in archivista itself uh, which can be later retrieved and uh, applied towards the policies which we uh, towards the attestation which we generate so coming to the next slide uh, here's a sample of uh, decrypted attestation so it's too big we just wanted to show the graph of how it looks and uh, how it's useful oh, it's okay. sorry it's okay. Okay. so uh, if you see here, we have subjects. Subjects are nothing but whatever required to execute that particular command. Here, you you see my email, right? Uh, so this is a committer's email or committer information, Git metadata, and uh, whatever files were required to execute those particular commands, and their respective SHAs. And here, I generated six types of attestations. Uh, one is for the environment, which which defines the build identity. So right now it's showing uh, the OS on which it was generated from, but this data can be enriched by using Spiffy or Spire uh, to uh, capture the machine identity from which was uh, from where the build was run from. So here's the S bomb which was generated and. Uh, uh, it captures the SBOM schema, uh, the product or the tools which were used to generate the SBOM, uh, and the, uh, its direct and transfer dependencies. Like here, these are the transfer dependencies for uh, requests. Uh, if it has a vulnerability or license information, it, it would be captured into the attestation as well, and we can write policies to see, like for example, if particular license is accepted by the legal or not. Uh, Here's the JIT register, uh, in basically capturing the committer metadata or, uh, or metadata of the commit which trigger the build and whatever files which are cloned from the Git repository over there. And the material attester, uh, it basically captures whatever files which were present on the build machine during the command was executed and they show us. So we can identify like if any malicious file was present on the build machine during the build process as well. And uh, we can capture the uh, build command, uh, which was triggered, uh, and its respective exit code. And uh, finally, the product, which was generated from the build command, and uh, the show of the file as well. Next, I'll give it to Jesse to talk about our next steps, our vision. Right. So. <clears throat> That was pretty dense, and uh, if anyone is very very interested, we'd we'll be happy to talk with take you through it a little bit slower after this. Um, but but as you can see, those attestations contain a rich variety of information about that build process, right? And and the associated policies can query any of those aspects uh, in order to you know uh, um, decide whether or not the build was good, right? So we're telling those stories, um, and and that that's our trust telemetry at work. Um, so how can we get started uh, uh, with telling these SDL sto SDLC stories, right? Um, well, you, you kind of need to start by accounting for your, your, your processes, right? Know your, your CI CD processes, um, even if they are diverse, right? Um, there's tooling that can help you instrument them. Um, and threat modeling helps, right? So, so threat modeling your SDLC itself um, will, will lead you to, to a place where you, you, you have a well understood model of, of what, you're, what you're doing when you produce your software. Um, and then find the places that you can instrument, right? Like not everything is going to be able to be wrapped in a witness command, um, but sometimes you might be able to make use of cosine or the Intoto, uh, ver uh, in sorry, the Intoto suite uh, specifically itself. Um, and, and, you know, uh, use the common predicate types first, and those will help you, uh, you know, if you, if you look at this, the, the, the list of types that are available to you, um, it'll make some of the spots where you would want to instrument obvious, right? And then in store, uh, sorry, uh, sort those, those places by the, the, the places that instill the greatest trust, right? Um, you know, where you might be downloading libraries over the open internet, right? Things like that. You might want to have extra eyes on, on those locations in your SDLC. 
Um, and then instrument and write policy to make sure that things are going as the way is expected, and then repeat. So where can we take this, right? Well, I would love to do a, a much longer talk on centralized policy evaluation. I'll, 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 I'll talk about it a little bit next. Um, uh, but, but generally speaking, um, you, know, uh, you can get a lot of benefits um, from making the evaluation of policy done um, in a central location. Um, but also, now that we have this you know, data lake of all these attestations, of all of our builds over time, right, which is going to be uh, voluminous, right, it'll be, there'll be a lot of information there. We can actually start to train ML models on that, right? We can start to, you know, introduce uh, whether or not a build was good or not as, as kind of an output of, of a series of attestations and then hopefully be able to utilize that ML model to be able to get early warnings or understanding um, for possibly getting trust, trust decisions much earlier in the SDLC process. And you can actually augment that data set with like uh, developer productivity tooling that, that would like track whether or not change induced incidents uh, uh, were caused by a build or whether or not the code quality that was produced was, was done right, um, depending on your organization. So, so back to that centralized policy decisions. I would love to have gone like the pair to this, this how we build the attestations themselves uh, to, to a deep dive in, in the policy. So if you like this talk or if you want more information about it, influence you know, the, the uh, selection uh, uh, team and, and we will do another talk hopefully next year um, about policy decisions. But um, essentially, you know, now that we have this centralized data lake, which is this graph API, which is kind of foundational to this, you can now create a, a, a kind of policy evaluation API, which is kind of like allows you to make policy decisions pluggable throughout your SDLC. Um, and you, you can uh, uh, start to um, wrap a lot more of the diversity of, of your SDLC by, by allowing for, for your developers to kind of just like put into place an a, 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 a API call that says, I have this artifact, I'm at this phase or this particular step in my SDLC, can I go forward, right? Um, thank you, that was having trouble with that. Um, and, uh, you know, not only does that make the, wrapping that diversity easier, easier, but it also allows you to have a, a true separation of concerns between the people who are producing the software pipelines um, that are, you know, um, building the artifacts themselves and the people who are writing policy to police those software pipelines, to decide whether or not things are allowed to go into production and so on and so forth. So we can actually you know, uh, have the, you know, the compliance team write policies that then apply to all the places where we have software being built, rather than having to ask these teams to implement those checks themselves, they can just make these API calls to the central policy evaluation API. And finally, as we develop these policies, right, we, as we kind of like evolve the way that we decide whether or not we trust the story of our software, um, we can back test those policies against this centralized data lake with this policy evaluation tool rather than having to like rerun pipelines to find out if the policy is going to break the build uh, or, or if it'll allow, you know, false positives or negatives to occur, right? So we can do like dry runs, for instance, which is pretty powerful. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to call out that we're also doing a talk at KubeCon this year on, on, on a, a kind of like a, a more robust understanding of Autodesk software supply chain security, uh, paired with, with uh, Vikram from Adobe. Um, and we want to just give a shout out to uh, Gus Tabaris and Uday Baskar from our teams, uh, and Joshua Wang actually, for instance, for helping us do some of the implementation uh, of the tooling that's here. We have time for questions. I'm just going to move it back to this other slide so that folks can see these links as well, if you want to take a photo of that. A lot of what 
you see in these attestations actually came from the contextual attestation spec that's coming out of 8.10, which is the in toto uh, uh, change format. Thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, it was very educational, particularly because I I didn't have any background on on a lot of this. Um, throughout today and yesterday, S bomb has come up in God knows how many different contexts, and it, it, it's clearly one of the main themes this year. Um, this was certainly the most detailed technical presentation I've seen on it since I've been here, but. Do you, one of the questions I've been asking a couple times and I haven't quite gotten a, a super clear answer to it yet because there's all these different SBOM formats effectively, right? And you've yeah. got them listed here. Mm -hmm. um, do you see convergence or are they truly made for different use cases and will survive on their own and grow in their own direction? Do you, do you see this getting consolidated? And if so, what are the early indications of that consolidation to you from your perspective? Well, I, I think it really depends on the use case, right? Like, uh, you know, the Cyclone DX and, and, and SPDX formats, you know, they, they are, you know, there's nuance to what's different about them, but I think at, at, at their core, it's about understanding dependencies, right? Um, and uh, I think, you know, when writing policy, one of, the, one of the useful things about the in total attestation spec, and like I mentioned earlier, like those semantics around a particular type of attestation, is that you, know, you can kind of like rely upon certain aspects, certain parts of that metadata to be abstract, depending on you know, what are, whatever the underlying vendor implementation. Now for, for, for the attestations around the Cyclone DX and SPDX formats, there's actually, it, they, they're, they're different, uh, um, different attestation specs, but um, I would imagine that um, you know over time, you know the ven vendor you know lock-in shakes out. Um, I, I, I think there's kind of two aspects to your question there. One is very specific to S bombs, and so you know I'll let, actually I'll let Jagadesh kind of go, go into a little bit more detail there. But um, I do want to call out that that what we're talking about here with these attestations is allowing Autodesk to unlock that vendor new, vendor neutral. Aspect of it, right? We have these, 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 these kind of like this, this DevSecOps API, right? We can speak fluently now across all of these different, th th this different tooling. Um, but go ahead if you want to talk about S bombs. Irrespective of the format, right? Like you have different levels, of, levels of S bomb as well. Like you have your pre-built repository, right? You have a manifest file where you can generate an S bomb from, and you have a runtime container where you can generate an S bomb from. So which, which, which S bomb do you want to share it with your customers or vendors, right? Uh, so ideally what we want to do is like irrespective of the format, is irrespective of level of where we generate the S-bomb from, we want to store it all, right? We want to store it all, we want to query it later, and we, we want to check like, is it okay? Is it, is, is it trusted? I, everything was as expected, like nothing, no, no third party actor was introduced in the middle of the build process, right? So irrespective of the format, irrespective of uh, the data it holds, we want to capture everything uh, which goes through our build pipelines and our SDLC. Yeah, there's an important part of what you just said there that might not have, we can needle out. Like, you could produce an SBOM when you do your Git clone of your repository. You can see like what the requirements.txt contains, right? And then you can get the transitive dependencies from that. Or you could do static analysis after the build was done to kind of understand like, oh, okay, well the code actually has this stuff in it inside this, you know, uh, tarball, right? Um, or you, you could you could probably produce SBOMs along the way in different as different parts of that 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 chain, right? And so really, depending on where you take that snapshot of the SBOM, you might get different information. And like Jagat is just saying, we are actually can try and capture all of that, right? We're putting all of that into that Archivista database and now it's in that graph API, right? And because we have the cryptographic hashes of all the files as well, we can now start to see like how those all tie together in that much larger superset of all of those S-bombs. I, I got that piece. So th that there you're speaking specifically to the value proposition of it and I, I, I'm totally sold. 
when it comes to the different, like even just like right there, what you've got on the slide, like right. these different ways of expressing it, are they are they different ways of expressing it because of what you just described? Because you would use different S bomb formats at different parts of the supply chain, and they're optimized for different sections of the supply chain. Why is there not one spec to rule them all for expressing all of the different things that you might capture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there's, there is two competing formats there, right? Um, I. I don't believe that one is better for a different part of the supply chain. I think this is a classic example of, of a vendor split here, um, or, or you know, an open source versus a vendor, a pre-existing vendor-specific format, right? Um, yeah, I, I think this is the type of thing that evolves over time, and, and I would I would imagine that there will be some you know vendor-neutral version of that ultimately. And, and at this, but at this point, you're not putting your eggs in any of any one basket. No, because we actually have a lot of different tools, <laughs> and so that, and that's what's handy. Like again, part of why we ended up going with the Intoto attestation spec as a as a packaging mechanism for these, because we wrap that the, the S bomb's like a big JSON, right? We wrap that with an attestation, and then we store that attestation in Archivista so that we can then query it inside this kind of uniform way, right? Um, we could have SPDX S bombs over here, and you know, Cyclone DX S bombs over there, and some are produced by one tool and some are produced by another, and then try to like bring them together later, right? But how do you write policy on that? It's going to be really ugly, and you're going to have like lots of, you know, difficulty and, and probably a lot of holes in what, what you're actually like looking at. So, um, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. There, there's 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 something to be wanted about that uniformity, and that's actually kind of what we're building in with that attestations, uh, with the use of attestations. Thank you. Yeah. But it's not just S bombs, right? Like, we want to we want to take all of these different things, right? Like salsa provenance, alongside the S bombs, alongside, and so that's where that story starts to be built. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. For that great question, though. Fair question. I think we got three more minutes. Anyone else? Anything else you want to call out? I'm going to move back to the last slide so you guys can take a look at that if, in case anyone didn't get a, get a photo. There was one, one thing I wanted to call out about Witness. Um, you know, one of the things that you don't see uh, in those slides there is that um, what's really great about Witness and its pairing with Archivista is that the policies themselves are stored in Archivista. So now you have this like centralized policy repository, which helps you deal with policy distribution, right? Policy distribution is a big problem, um, especially when you have policy invoked in multiple different places in your SDLC, when you don't have that centralized policy evaluation tool, right? Now I have, I need to know if the policy that I have is currently up to date in the, in the right policy at this particular point in my SDLC versus over here versus over here. A new company comes in, I now need to give them access to the policy and so on and so forth. So having that one tool be our kind of policy store alongside of the attestation store is really powerful. All right, well, thank you guys very much. I hope you guys had a great conference. We'll hope to see you next year. Thank you.